Welcome back. So, today we're going to continue where we left off last time, and we're going to introduce you to a new idea that's going to help us structure our small computer program. So, at this point, you guys understand the basic building blocks of imperative programming. You understand how to manipulate data, you understand how to get computers to make simple decisions, and you understand how to repeat steps over and over again. So, today what we're going to introduce is an organizing principle that's going to allow us to uh, start to build larger programs with a high degree of confidence by breaking them down into smaller pieces. Uh, what we're going to talk about today are, is something called a function, a small reusable piece of logic that does one specific thing. So I can reuse that in different parts of my code when I need to do the same thing. I can test it, which is something that you guys are going to see on MP0, which will be released today. Um, and it makes larger pieces of code much, much easier to understand. If all you did was write everything in one big block of code, your program would very, very quickly become impossible for anybody to understand, comprehend, use, or reason about. All right, so one thing I want to point out starting today is that this is the rhythm that we're getting into for the rest of the semester. So, you know, our goal with this class is to have the workload be as consistent as possible. So, the last couple of weeks, you guys have been doing homework problems on the weekend. That's sort of been designed partly to prepare you to work on the MPs. So this class is not going to get easier. It'll get a little harder maybe some weeks, a little easier other weeks. Um, but our goal is to have you working consistently, steadily from now until May. And this is kind of how things work in this class. So, you know, here, here's what your week's going to look like. Um, on Mondays, you'll usually be either working on an MP or wrapping up one and starting another. Uh, there'll be homework, lecture, and office hours. So that's Monday. Uh, Tuesday, you have a lab. Maybe you'll take a quiz, be working on a particular MP, have a homework problem. We have residential office hours on Tuesdays now. Wednesday, pretty much the same as Tuesday, except we have a lecture. Um, Thursday is really kind of a day in the week where you need to start getting serious about that MP. Uh, because we have a lot of office hours. You don't have a quiz. There's no lectures. This is a good day to come in office hours and make some progress. I have a lot of CAs there ready to help you. Friday, very similar to Monday, work on the MP, do the homework problem, come to office hours, come to lecture. Weekends from this point forward will not typically involve a homework problem. Instead, what you'll be doing is working on that MP that's out. So this weekend, budget some time to work on MP0, which we'll release today. And that's, again, that's how things go. So that's pretty much what we're going to do from here on out. Uh, we're going to try to keep you busy, but I don't want, you know, moments in this class to be overwhelming. Uh, but part of that... Up to at this point, particularly once we start working on the MPs, is really on you. If you wait till the night before to start the MPs, then you will have bad memories from this class. Memories involving lack of sleep, desperate forum posts at three in the morning, hoping that somebody will be awake to answer them. Sometimes somebody will, sometimes that person will be me, uh, but other times they'll be firing into the void and you'll be very frustrated. But if you plan out your schedule so that you start things on time and work on them steadily, you can and will succeed in this class. So as I pointed out, we pretty much covered everything we wanted to talk about in terms of the basic building blocks of imperative program. We know how to make the data, we know how to make simple decisions, we know how to repeat stuff. Um, we'll come back and talk a little bit later in the semester about how computers communicate with each other, because that's super interesting and obviously a big part of modern uh, life and technology. Um, but for now, let me talk about what we're going to do for the rest of the semester. So there's really kind of three things that are going to occupy us. The first is, we're going to talk a lot, we started this on Friday, we're going to continue today talking a lot about algorithms, how we solve problems using, that's weird, I thought I heard something behind me, um, somebody's creeping up on me from behind the stage, um, how we use computers to solve problems. We'll come up with some today, and this is something that we'll be doing over and over again. A lot of times, the functions that you'll be writing, you'll be using to implement simple algorithms. We'll talk about data structures. So how do we work with data in computing? Computer science is a field that works heavily with data all the time. I know there's this trendy thing now called data science. But data science is like, is computer science, basically. You guys, when you're done, will have the most powerful tool you need to work with data. And so we'll talk more about how to structure it, and we'll try to do a lot of examples as we go through the semester, starting with today's MP, having you work with real, actual data, manipulating it, storing it, transforming it in various ways. Finally, 
working on large pieces of software. So I'll talk a little bit about this at the end of today's class uh, when I talk a little bit about MP0. But to some degree, some of the software development skills that we're going to try to introduce on the MPs are really quite distinct from what you're going to see on the homework problems and quizzes. You know, if, when you guys go out, and you will, when you guys get jobs in the software development industry, go work at some hot startup, or after you've been working on your new app that's going to transform the world for a couple of months, it gets complicated. It gets large. You know, there's pieces of it that your buddy wrote that you don't quite understand. You might start at a company and the first thing is, oh yeah, add some feature to this uh, existing piece of software that we've been maintaining for a decade. That's very different than writing a little 10 line function into your browser window to solve one of our homework problems. So we want you to have that experience as well. The MPs are a big part of how that's gonna happen. So starting today, you're gonna, you know, at 5 p.m. or around that time when we release the first MP, some of you are gonna sit down and just be like, my God, what is going on here? There's all this code in front of me I don't understand. That's part of our intention. That's intentional, because that's part of life as a software developer. All of this is going to be a tremendous amount of fun, um, because this stuff is super cool. So I'm excited, uh, and I hope you are as well. OK, so let's talk a little bit about how we structure these small computer programs that we're starting to be able to write. So here are some of the goals that we have when we think about how to structure our code. We want to break things up into reusable bits. So, you know, we've written code, for example, to sum an array. I don't want to have to write that piece of code every time I need to sum the values in an array. That would be really error prone. If I make a mistake one place, and I copy that code all over the place, then it gets duplicated everywhere. So I want to be able to break uh, my code up into smaller pieces, where each piece does one task, and then I can sort of look at it, comprehend what it does, and sometimes when I'm working on a larger system, what I'm actually doing is focused very closely on fixing one particular part of it or understanding what one small piece does. So I want to be able to do this. The other thing that I want to be able to do is combine state and behavior. So we'll talk about this when we get to objects. This is sort of a roadmap for the next uh, couple of weeks in the class. And along the way, we're also going to be encouraging and requiring you guys to document what you're doing carefully. And I'll show you some examples of that later, and you'll see some examples on today's MPs. Modern software development is a community effort. If you, you know, if you write a beautiful new algorithm to solve some problem and just toss it online with no explanation, no documentation, no instructions, nobody will use it. It doesn't matter how good it is. You have to explain what you've done to other people. That's an incredibly important part of how we build modern software. So we don't understand the code we understand the documentation. That's what allows us to use it. Okay, so, and then try to, and that allows us to reuse existing solutions. So these two last things go together. When other people write good documentation, it allows you to use their code without understanding exactly what it does. You just need to know how to use it. When you write good documentation, it lets other people understand how to use your code. And that allows you to share your code with others. Okay, so. Today's new idea, and this will be tested lightly in the multiple choice uh, section of this week's quiz, is something called a function. Sometimes they're called subroutines. Sometimes they're called methods. You'll hear lots of different terms for them. We're going to try to use the term function as much as possible. So a function is, according to Wikipedia, a sequence of programming instructions that perform some task packaged together. So what we're going to start to do so we're going to start to take one thing that we're trying to do and write code to accomplish that and set that up so that it can be reused in other parts of our code. So until now, we've been writing these sequence of instructions to you know, find the maximum element in array or something like that. But now what we're going to do is we're going to show you how to package that up in a nice, tidy little you know, a bundle so that you can then reuse it throughout other parts of your code. So in Java, and this varies by language to language. Some languages have different, um, different capabilities when it comes to functions. But in Java, a function takes zero or one inputs so, and produces zero or one output. Sorry, zero or more inputs and produces zero or one output. So you can think of a function as, you know, like a, some sort of black box that you give it some data, it turns around a little bit, hands you back a result. That's how it works. And in Java, I can, normally, my function returns one result, 
one value. Um, sometimes it makes sense to have functions that don't return anything in certain cases, um, but I can't return multiple values. In other languages, sometimes you can return multiple values from a function. Java doesn't allow that. We'll see ways to accomplish the same thing later. Oop, sorry. So a function is not something to be af afraid of. It just contains, it's a block of code made up of the type of things we've already talked about. So when we implement functions, we're just going to be using the same constructs we've already looked at. Functions can de declare variables. They can make decisions using conditional statements and expressions. They can repeat operations using loops. It's just the stuff that we've already talked about. This is just a way to package it up in a reusable form. So let me show you, let's go, let's go back here. So let me show you a function declaration. So there's a couple of parts of this. So right here at the top, the first seven lines from lines one to seven are a, what's called a Java doc comment. This is documentation. This is, for our purposes, part of the function. You, can you write a function without documentation? You can. Can you write a function in this class on the MP without documentation? No. To me, these two things it really should be a requirement that you provide this, not optional. The documentation explains something about what the function does. So it says adds two numbers together, and then there's some you know, uh, information about exactly what the function expects you to provide, and we'll explain that in a second. That'll make more sense once we look at the function declaration itself. So on line eight, I have the declaration for a function. So this is new syntax for us. It starts all the way on the left with an indication of what the function returns when I call it. So this is the output. This function returns an int. A function in Java can return, like I said, zero or one result. That result can be any Java type. So, so far in Java, we know about the primitive types, we know about ints, cares, doubles, uh, I can return arrays. You'll see that in MP0. Um, so this returns a single int. That's reading left to right. The next thing is the name of the function followed by parentheses. So the name of this function is add. It's a good name for it, given what it does. Then within the parentheses, I have a list of arguments. So these are the inputs to this function. Each argument looks a lot like a variable declaration. It indicates both the type of the variable and the name. The name is up to you. You can call them what you want. So what this says is that add takes two arguments. The first one is an int, and add is gonna call that inside the function first number. The second argument is also an int, and inside the function, add is going to call that second number. The order of these is important. If you call it with zero, one, then zero is first number and one is second number. If you call it with one, zero, then one is first number and zero is second. Okay, then all the way to the right, we see this familiar curly brace that opens up a block. So a function, like I said, contains a block of code. And inside that block, you can do anything you want. This is a fairly simple function that only does one thing. All it does, is, so this is a return statement, which we'll talk about in a minute. This is how you indicate the output of the function. So all this function does is it returns the sum of these two numbers. So it returns first number plus second number. This is probably too simple of a function. This is not the kind of function that you should really uh, typically use because um, even though it's solving a common problem, it's solving a, a problem that I can just write a statement. For. So I would never call add, add two numbers, I would just add them directly in the code but this is just a simple example to get you started. Then going back to the documentation, I have um, information, so javadoc allows me to, uh, allows me, requires that I provide information about every parameter uh, or every argument that this function takes. So this is just human readable um, information, so first number is the first number to add, second number is the second number to add, and then it returns the sum of the two numbers. So this is used, I'll show you in a few slides, to generate documentation for this function. All right, so let's talk about a good function. So a good function does one thing well, doesn't try to do too much, does a, a, a fairly self-contained piece of the program's logic. That allows it to be easily tested. That means that you can write test suites 
that, comp that you know, say, okay, if this function is really working the way I expect, when I give it certain inputs, I expect a certain output, and I can verify that. Testing is such an enormous part of modern software development. I can't even tell you. You know, I, and, and this is something that we're introducing you to, obviously, in the homework problems, but also on RMPs. You know, if you go to, if, if you go and work for Facebook or whatever, you know, if you have something new, even if it's really exciting, it probably takes days before that change will be, well, they will consider it ready to deploy on their actual site. And during that time, not only will be there be a lot of human review, but there'll also be a huge amount of automated testing. So every big company has a huge amount of infrastructure, lots of machines devoted to automatically testing things. So Facebook probably has lots of tests that it's like, log into the site and pretend I'm a user and click around on a bunch of stuff and make sure everything works. If they don't do that, then it's, you know, it's very dangerous to deploy any change because who knows, it might break the site for some number of people. And in Facebook, if you break the site for even a small number of people, you're still talking about tens of thousands. Big, widely used site. Okay. So, in Java, just to review, every function has a name. In this case, it's add. A list of arguments, first number and second number, that comes inside the parentheses. A return type, that's all the way at the left. This function returns an int. And javadoc. And then a return statement as well. Those are the, these are the sort of the parts of every function that you're going to see in this class. The name and the description of the function are for you. You can call your functions whatever you want, it's sort of like a variable name. And, we'll, and like variable names, there are bad and good names for functions. If I called this function foo, that wouldn't be very useful because I would forget what it did pretty quickly. The arguments and return type are both for you and for Java. So when Java runs your code, when Java, a Java program is compiled and executed, Java will check to make sure that, you know, if I declare a variable of a certain type and then set it based on the value of a function, that those types match. So Java uses the type that you declare for your function to do type checking. We'll talk about this a little bit more in a few days when we talk about the compiler. The Java doc is for you and for others, for anybody who uses, uses the code. And again, you might be wondering, why would I document my own code? I mean, I'm going to understand all of it. Well, you understand all of it when you're working on it, and then a month goes by, and you're squinting at the same piece of code again. Like, what does this do? Why did I write it this way? So, you know, documentation will be as helpful to you when you work on something for a while as it is to anybody else. So how do we use a function? So using a function is referred to as calling it. In order to call a function, I have to provide the arguments that it wants. I need to use its name. I need to provide it with any inputs. Oh, hello. Uh-oh. Technical difficulties. There we go. So to use a function, I need to call it with the arguments that it expects. And I need to be prepared to receive whatever result it's going to give me. The code that, so there's some terminology related to this. The code that calls the function is referred to as the caller. And sometimes the function is the callee. So when a function is called, we'll look at some examples of this in a minute, the execution of your code continues inside that function. So when I call a function, Java jumps into that function, starts executing the code inside the block, and until the function returns, my code is stopped. So I wait for the result of that function before my code continues to execute. What you do with the result is up to you. You can save it, you can use it as part of a calculation or part of your program, you can discard it. It's not usually useful to discard the result from a function, but there are some cases where uh, it is done. Okay, so, so here's an example um, of using a function. So that's my add function. On line 11, what I'm, on the left side, this is a variable declaration. So I've seen this before. I'm telling Java I wanna use a variable called result of type int. But before I've always initialized variables using a literal. I can also initialize variables based on the result of a function call. So in this case, I'm saying declare a variable called result and set its initial value to be the result of calling add with the arguments three and four. And when you run this code, Java will check this. It'll say, okay, you said that result is an int. 
and you're initializing it with this function called add, I'm going to make sure that add returns an int, or something that I can safely cast to an int. I'm going to, I can also use functions pretty much anywhere I would expect an int literal. So I could print the result of a function directly, like I'm doing on line 12. I can use functions as part of a larger computation, like I'm doing on line 13. So on line 13, I'm declaring a new variable called bigger result, and I'm initializing it to the result of calling add with 10 and 20, and calling add with 20 and 30, and then a literal 10. So I can do that. And then I can print it. Again, I can also just call add without doing anything with the return value. This is sort of dumb, because why would I call, like, it's like a tree falling in the forest with nobody there to hear it. The value is just discarded. And actually, I think Android Studio will warn you about this if you try to do that. All right, so one thing that's a source of confusion here, I just want to address this, it's just a limitation of the environment that we use to run these uh, snippets. Uh, please just ignore this static keyword on the function. It's worse than that. If you actually use the static keyword on our homework problems, typically things are going to break. I'm sorry about this. This is just kind of the way things work for this little example tool that we use. Um, but when you're solving our prayer learn homework problems, you don't need that, and in fact, your code probably won't work with it. So just pre you know, pretend it's not there, except for the fact that you do need to use it. Um, I'm declaring on line two that same add function that I just described. It takes first number and second number and returns the sum of the two. And now let's run this code. So result, I can print off result here too. So the first thing I do is I call add on three and four. That's going to return seven. I save that to result, and then lo and behold, result is seven. That's good to know. One thing I want to show you is, is sort of how the code flow works here. So let me put a print statement into my adding my add function. So you can use this to kind of walk through what's happening. So when Java executes line six, it says you want to use a variable called result, and then it says, oh, you're calling a function. So I jump into the function, and I add three and four. So that's the first time you see adding being printed, when it's being used to add three and four. That Result is then saved in the variable result, and then I see the print statement from the next line. What happens on line eight is even more interesting. So Java starts running line eight. It says, oh, you're printing something. But then it says, oh, I don't know what you're printing yet. I have to call add with these arguments, four and five. So let's do that first. So you'll see adding is printed again. In fact, let me, uh, let me do this. This will be more useful. Let me, stick, let me stick these arguments in here so we can actually see what's being added in each call. All right. So it starts executing line eight, but before it can print the result, it has to compute the result. So it calls add, add prints adding four and five, and then I see nine. When I get down to bigger result, you'll see I'm going right to left. So I say I want to use a variable called bigger result to type int. I want to initialize it to, okay, Java starts working from left to right. It says, okay, the first part of this is the result of calling add 10 and 20, so you see add run. Gets a result, moves on. It says, okay, well, I also need to compute the result of calling add with 20 and 30. So you'll see that get called. And then the last thing is the literal, so I don't have to do any more work. Add everything together, and I get 90. So just like variable names, it's a good chance for us to review, choosing good function names will make your life a lot easier as a program. I, maybe I would argue, actually, good function names are even more important than good variable names because they're more exposed to you and to other programmers. If you choose good function names, you can write a function and then kind of forget exactly what it does. Just remember based on the name, oh, that's add. Right. What does it do? It adds two numbers. Okay, I know what it does. I, I don't, even, I don't go, go back and look at the code again. You know, if you, ver if you name functions poorly, every time you use one, you'll find yourself rereading the code to make sure it does what you want. If you name functions well, you'll never have to do that because the name will remind you. So 
They're good function names, like variable names, are descriptive. Um, they indicate what the function does. They help jog your memory, and they might help explain it to other people. They're as short as possible, but see number two, right? So as short as possible without being non-indicative, right? I want the function name to describe as much as possible what the function does. If your function names start to be like 30, 40, 50 characters long, then you might need to like tone it down a little bit. But, but I would probably err on that side as opposed to having it be too short. Don't name your function A just because you want to save keystrokes because you'll never remember what it does. Okay. So let's talk about function arguments. So those arguments of the function, as the function executes, function has access to the values that are provided by the caller. So you can think about it this way. The function says, I need these inputs in order to run. But the caller gets to choose their values. So with add, add said I need two numbers to add, first number and second number. I know how to add them together. You just got to tell me which, what, what you want me to add. When the function starts to run, those variables are already set up for you. You don't need to initialize them. They're already initialized to the values that the caller picked. So again, you can think of these variables as sort of pre-declared and initialized. You can use them without declaring them, and they will have values in them, whatever the caller set when they called your function. So if I print, and I just did this actually, so if I print first number and second number, so you'll see add is saying I need two arguments in order to work. I'm going to call those arguments first number and second number. When you call me on line 14, the code is saying I'm choosing the value of 3 for first number, and I'm choosing the value of 4 for second number. And then off we go. Then we're ready to go. So we, we essentially just did this. I'm just going to move on. The last piece of this puzzle is return. So return, like it indicates, returns a value to the caller. It also is the last thing the function does. Always. A function that indicates that it's going to return a double must have a return statement returning a double. And that will be the last statement executed inside the function. So what does that imply? It implies that when you return, you immediately exit the function. It doesn't matter where you are. Even if there's code below the return statement, it never gets executed. If you're in a loop and you call return, the loop never executes again. If you're in an if statement you call return, you never drop below the if statement. Return immediately executes, sorry, ret return immediately exits the function and returns a value to the call. Immediately. It's important to understand. You can put a return statement anywhere you want. It doesn't have to be outside of a loop or conditional. It can be anywhere. But as soon as you find one on any path through your code, the function is going to stop immediately. Nothing else runs. Period. You can include multiple return statements in your function. This is particularly important once we start to have things like conditionals. So you might have a function that says, if one thing is true, return one value, otherwise return another value. That's totally OK, and in fact, extremely common. But the thing that to keep in mind is that the function will exit as soon as it hits the return first. The first return statement it reaches is a common source of confusion. We'll have people in office hours debugging their code, and they'll be like, I can't understand why this isn't working. I'm calling this, and I'm expecting this value. And then you look around, and you're like, and they're looking at code in the function that's never being executed, because their function returned you know, up 10 lines, right? It hit some conditional they weren't expecting, returned a value, and the code that, they're tr they, that they think isn't working is actually never even being run. So as soon as your function hits a return statement, it will immediately execute. A function must return a value of the type indicated. And something that can be confusing sometimes is that the Java has to be, you have to show Java. Java has to be able to, to guarantee that the function can return, will return a value. Sometimes you have, if you have a conditional, you know that one of the two if else statements will be true, 
But Java isn't certain about that, and so you'll get this error that says, you know, must return a value. All right, so Javadoc I've already preached a little bit about today, but I'll come back to it because it's super important. So Javadoc is this special type of structured documentation. It has a particular format, and CheckStyle and Intel uh, Android Studio are going to help you with that, learn how to write that over the next couple MPs. But here's why we do this. I just want to point out what happens here. You write this in your code, and you might think, why am I doing this? The reason you're doing this is because there's a tool that then uses it to generate this quote unquote beautiful. This was like beautiful in maybe 1992, right? Now it looks a little dated, but it's still very useful. You guys will see lots of Javadoc in the next couple of weeks and over up throughout the course of the semester. So this is Java documentation. This is where it ends up. So this is an actual website you can go to. It has information about a particular type of Java object called a string that we will start talking about on Wednesday. The code that implements all these functions contains all of this documentation, but there's a tool that then builds this sort of nice and navigable, um, you know, essentially piece of online documentation that I can use to find out all about how Java stores strings. So that's the connection. You write this, you write a lot of this, and you end up with this. That's, that's the idea behind Java. You'll see that on our own MPs. One of the things we do on every MP is we publish Javadoc for you to look at. Um, it, and that can be a nice way to sort of browse around and see what the MP is supposed to be doing without having to dig through all the code. Okay, good. So there's this connection frequently between functions and algorithms. So functions, which we're talking about today, and algorithms, which we introduced last time. So it's pretty common and quite useful for a function to implement a specific algorithm. So you call the function to solve a particular problem, and the function does that. One of the reasons why this is so nice is a lot of times algorithms are nicely self-contained. So for example, finding the maximum value in an array. There's an algorithm to do that, and I can use a function to implement it, and then I can use that function any time I need to find a maximum in an array. I don't have to keep cutting and pasting that code uh, all over. So as a review, just from last time, so because we're about to do a couple of these examples, I d and I just want to make sure that this is clear as well, an algorithm is a way that we solve a problem. And a computer algorithm is a set of steps for solving a problem using a computer. And there are sometimes times where we want to use certain computer capabilities. Again, there's times when computers solve problems very differently to how you would, because they have different skills and abilities. As computer scientists, we implement algorithms by using these imperative uh, constructs that you guys have learned. Um, but a lot of times what I'll do is I'll take an algorithm, like finding the greatest common denominator or a bunch of uh, numbers, and I'll package it up as a function. Okay, let's do some examples here of, of writing functions. And we're going to use them again to implement a couple of algorithms. Okay, so, and we'll get some practice with the rates as well. So here's a problem. I have an array of values, and I want to write a function that takes the array, and let's say I just want to print out any time that, I, that two of the elements in this array of characters that are next to each other are the same. So I can give you any number of characters, and any time you see two adjacent elements that are the same, I want you to print one of those elements. Okay, so how are we gonna do this? Let's talk about our algorithm first before we try to implement. Who can give me a set of steps for solving this problem? Yeah. So I definitely need a for loop. It's a great starting point. I'm going to have to look at every element in the array. So I'm going to use a for loop. What am I going to do inside the for loop? Yeah. Yeah, so I'm, I'm comparing adjacent values. So that's kind of new here. In the past, I've used a for loop to look at one value at a time. But now I'm going to use the for loop to look at pairs of values. So how am I going to do that? Let's say I write a for loop and I have an index variable i that gives me the current value. What's an adjacent value? Yeah. 
Bingo. Or I plus one. Yeah, depending on, you know, how you roll. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to examine every value. We're going to compare it with the next value, and we have an idea about how to do that. Um, and we'll print it off if they're the same. All right, so here's our little starting point. And I'm going to implement this using a function. This function does not have to return anything. So in Java, the type that I use for a function that doesn't return anything is something called void. That says that this function is not going to return a value. So I need that special static keyword. Um, let's call this consecutive identical. The argument is an array of characters. So first, let's just write that canonical for loop that we all know and love, or know and are starting to love. So let's just make sure that we can actually get at every value of this array. Okay, that looks good. Let me run this code. Uh oh, okay, there it goes. Didn't print anything, why not? What have I forgotten to do? Yeah. Didn't call the function, so I've declared a function. So I'm saying, I've got a way to do this, but I haven't actually called it yet. So let's call the function, and let's pass it this array of characters that I've created above. So let's do consecutive, uh, this is identical, and we'll pass it characters. So now I'm telling Java I want to run this function, and now I see the characters printed one per line. So that's good. That's, that's where, that's a good starting point. So now, there was a suggestion that I look at the, I think it was i minus one, so let's try, let's try doing that. So I need a conditional, so I'm gonna say if array i is equal to array i minus one, so array i is my current value, array i minus one is my previous value, let's print that value. Okay, so this, Looks good. Uh oh, got a problem. What is the problem here? Let's look at the error message. The error message says array index out of bounds exception. And then it gives me the index that was bad that I tried to use. And in this case, that bad index is negative one. So what's going on here? Yeah. Yeah, so what happens the first time I run this loop? What's the value of i? Zero, so what's i minus one? Ah, okay. So how can I fix this? I'm so close. Don't start at the first element. So this is important. If an array has n values, how many pairs of values does it have? Consecutive pairs. Doesn't have n. Think about it, if an array has two values, how many consecutive pairs does it have? If it has three values, how many consecutive pairs does it have? So it's always n minus one. So my loop can't execute n times. It has to only execute n minus one time, and I'm gonna start it at one. There we go. So let's see, does this look right? Okay, so I've got b here, and b is repeated, so I see that one printed, and then I've got c here, and c is repeated, so I see that one printed, good. This works. What about if I wanted to look at the current character and the next character? So I can also do it this way. Now I'm gonna have a different array out of bounds exception, seven. So what do I need to do here? So now I'm looking at the current character and the next character. What adjustment do I need to make to my loop to get this to work? Small, yeah. That is exactly correct. There we go. Also works. So I either have to start at the second element and look backwards, or only go to the second to last element and look forwards. Either one of those works. And again, I don't know if I have a preference. I think they're both nice. Okay. Let's come, well, you know what? Should we do this one? Yeah, why not? So it's not hard. What about if I want to compute the average of an array? 
Now this might sound hard at first, but you've done this problem already. What do I have to do to solve this problem? One of the things that you're going to start to see is that these little homework problems that we're giving you are building blocks for writing larger programs. That's one of the reasons we use them. You'll start to plug them in in various places. When you do MP0, you'll see places where it's like, oh, I need to do the maximum over an array or whatever, right? You'll start to recognize these as little snippets that you can use throughout your code because they're common constructs when you're processing data and solving problems. So computing the average, again, is actually a small variant on a problem that we've already solved. Which one is that? Yeah. Remember, we did sum. So how do I compute the average? First, I do what? I do a sum, and then what do I do? I buy the number of values. Yeah. So this is essentially a variant of array sum. It's not a new problem. But let's implement it using a function. So I'm going to declare my static function. This is going to return a double. So if I do the average of an array of doubles, the result is an, a double. I'm going to take an array. I'm going to call it values. So I'm going to plug in the code that we use to do the sum. Again, very common building block. I could also write that using the enhanced for loop. So now I've got the sum. Let's make sure that that works. Okay, and I'm going to call this function. And here, this function doesn't print anything normally. So I'm going to actually print the result of calling it. And I'm going to use this array that I've declared above. I'll use that length. Thank you. Oh, method must return a value. So that's, that's the error that you can see. So every method must return a value. So when Java tried to compile this, it said, wait, I don't see a return statement here. So for now, let's just return the sum. We know that's wrong, but that will at least allow our, us to test our code. OK? So the sum looks correct. Now how do I do the average? I've got the sum. All I need to do to finish the job is divide by the array length. I know what that is. So here what I'll do is divide by values. I'll get rid of my extra print statement. Here we go. You can test this out with some other inputs. What's one, so I'm, I'm, one of the things we're going to try to train you to do is be defensive programmers, sort of like being a defensive driver. What's one potential problem with this piece of code? Can anyone spot it? This code is correct, but I can cause it to fail. How do I do that? Yeah. If I pass an empty array, why? So if I pass an empty array, what's going to happen? I initialize sum to 0. The loop never executes because values.length is equal to 0. But then what do I do at the bottom? Take 0 divided by 0. Java will not be happy about that. It's not a real number. There are some languages where it'll be like, oh, whatever, it's just infinity or something, right? In JavaScript, I think that evaluates to undefined, which is pretty satisfying. Um, but in Java, that will cause a problem. Okay, got five minutes left, and I want to talk about MP0. So MP0 is coming out today. This is always kind of a big moment for a CS125 class. And we fiddle around with this every semester in terms of how we do it and when we do it. So this semester, it's coming out today. You're going to have a week to work on it. Why am I talking about this? Because some of you are going to sit down with this and totally freak out when you see the code that we're providing. This is not a homework problem. It requires, now the, the code you have to write is not much more complicated than a homework problem. But this is a whole Android application that we're providing. This actually works. It does cool stuff. There's a few little pieces you have to finish to make it a little bit cooler. But there's a fair amount of code in there that is going to be unfamiliar, frightening, scary, new, just I have no idea what I'm doing. Please stay calm. 
This is part of the goal. You will get used to this, and this is actually one of the learning objectives of this assignment. So I'm gonna, I want to explain that a little bit. First of all, we have a lot of help, as you know. We have CAs that have been sitting around in office hours waiting for you guys to show up. And I told them last week, I said, don't worry, the wait will be over. Next week, people will start coming to office hours. And they, they are excited to help you. There's a lot of them that are just kind of sitting around doing nothing right now. Uh, that's not what they signed up for, so they're, they're pumped about this. Um, but, you know, even with some help, we're going to give you time in lab this week. Okay, sorry, I need to have to say so, some more things about how we're going to do this. We're going to give you time in lab this week to work a little bit on MP0 and to get started with it. Um, so that'll help. Here's the thing, though. We are intentionally kind of pushing you into the pool with this MP. I mean, like, not quite the deep end, like the medium end. It's not the shallow end either. You hurt yourself if you get pushed in the shallow end, right? So we wanted to find enough water so you wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't get injured. But it's not, not, that, not that deep. It might seem deep. I don't know. I should stop this metaphor. It's sort of, uh, I'm not sure where it's going. Um, but look, this is not unintentional. The goal here is to have portions of this MP be complementary to what we do on the homework and in lecture. The type of small, really self-contained problems that we're teaching you how to solve are critical to your development as a computer scientist. They're training you to think about how to program computers by allowing you to focus on little things. But if you want to build really big, high-impact stuff, or maybe you want a job in the software development industry, you have to get used to working with big, gnarly, unfamiliar, complicated pieces of code. Because pretty much everything out there in the real world is that way. It's too late. If you wanted to start from scratch, you should have been born like 50 years earlier, okay? We started from scratch, right? We've made a lot of progress. There's all sorts of cool stuff for you to use. That's great. You know, you have the chance to stand on the shoulders of giants when you do stuff. It is not hard. So I, I wrote this, the starter code for this MP it's mind-boggling how easy it is to do something as complicated as track your location. A couple hundred lines of code, no problem. But, so again, this is part of our goal. Most of the points on this MP are for solving small problems that are a little bit harder than the homework problems we've been giving you, but there are some points for getting your hands dirty and hacking away on some of the front end pieces. And again, there's a learning objective here. The goal is not to scare you, to frighten you, the goal is to prepare you to operate in this kind of environment because it is something you will have to do. And if you learn how to do it, you'll be able to do really cool high impact stuff. Okay, great. We have homework problem today. The quiz that starts this week in the CBTF covers everything up through today. So please review at least the function material. There's no programming questions on functions, but there are some multiple choice questions. One thing I want to remind you, some of you who don't read the forum announcements might have missed the announcement about the announcements. Um, there is going to be extra credit this semester if you reliably read the announcements on the forum. I can tell how many people view those, and it's a frustratingly small number. And then we get repetitive questions on the forum and people don't know what's going on. So you're responsible for reading those announcements. There's 1% extra credit. If you do that, find the announcement about it. My, my office hours today will be downstairs in the basement rather than my office, and MP0 will be out this afternoon. Stay warm, everybody. I will see you on Wednesday um, if it's not like negative 30. <laughs>